If you've ever wondered why your testimony as a Christian, your words, your efforts, perhaps your example, doesn't seem to make an impact for the Lord on those living around you or working with you or in school with you, well, I want to encourage you today with the testimony and life of Jeremiah. His world is not going to listen to him. Judah is rushing towards self-destruction and ultimately God's judgment, and Jeremiah did everything he could to stop this national train wreck. But the truth is, uh, God didn't give Jeremiah any false sense of optimism about his nation, Judah. However, there will be individuals uh, who would listen to his message. They will repent. And this is why we find Jeremiah appealing to individuals to repent, while at the same time he's delivering a message of judgment to the entire nation. Frankly, that's the same kind of message that I'm going to be delivering today. I don't hold out any hope for any nation. God has not given the church today a commission to reach nations. The great commission from the Lord is to go and make disciples from within every nation. And as I often say, God hasn't called us to save America. He's called us to take the gospel to Americans and to to French people and to Africans and and Asians. Now, of course, if enough individuals believe, it just might turn a nation around like it did in Nineveh through the preaching of the prophet Jonah. Well, now here in chapter 7 in the book of Jeremiah, uh, we're going to cover chapter 7 through chapter 10. We have one single sermon. It's often called the temple sermon. Chapter 26 refers to the same sermon. And I'm, I'm going to mention here that the sermons or prophecies of Jeremiah, uh, they're not arranged chronologically. They're arranged topically, thematically. Jeremiah's sermon we're going to cover today could be entitled, One Nation Under Judgment. This is going to describe the fate of Judah and, and frankly, any nation that rejects God throughout the course of human history. Now, the first point Jeremiah is going to make concerns the people's misplaced trust. And chapter 7 begins with the Lord instructing Jeremiah to, to go stand at the gate of the temple and speak to those people who are coming to worship the Lord. And the prophet makes it clear here in verse 3 that there's very little real worship taking place in these days. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You know, apparently people are, you know, coming to worship and they're, they're repeating this phrase. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Well, they're just repeating it over and over like it's some kind of good luck charm, as if the, the mere presence of the Lord's temple is going to protect them. Well, let me tell you that the temple isn't a good luck charm. Without repentance and true worship, it's just another building. In fact, it's just like your church. You can go to your church. It's not a good luck charm unless your heart's right with God. In fact, God offers uh, proof of this now here in verse 12. Go down to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. Shiloh was that place where the Ark of the Covenant had resided for over 300 years. Shiloh was where Eli had served and little Samuel had grown up. But the Ark's presence, that golden box, I went a good luck charm. That didn't save Shiloh. In fact, I have personally stood there at Shiloh and I've looked around at the hills surrounding that area where the tribes of Israel had once worshipped and pieces of clay pots are still there thousands of years after those people had celebrated the Passover there. Today, it's a barren place. There's no magic. There's no mystical spiritual presence, so to speak. I didn't feel anything. 
in that place. You see, God is telling his people here through Jeremiah, you can go on looking toward the temple all you want, but it isn't going to help you. Your hope is not to be in a place. It is to be in a person, and that person is the true and living God. Well, now Jeremiah says in the next few verses that the people are also trusting in the wrong deity. Verse 18 says, The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. Oh, more than likely the queen of heaven mentioned here is the Assyrian and Babylonian goddess Ishtar. Now, we know from history that people made special cakes for Ishtar, and they called her the queen of heaven. i got to tell you, if I were God, I'd make sure those cakes burned to a crisp every time an Israelite tried to bake one of them. In fact, I'd probably set their stoves on fire, if not their kitchens. But God patiently warns them instead. Well, now the second point in Jeremiah's sermon concerns not only their misplaced trust, but now secondly, their rejection of God's law. And that's the focus here in chapter 8 as it begins. And over here in verse 6, we read, everyone turns to his own course like a horse plunging headlong into battle. The nation is so far removed from the word of God that God then goes on to say through Jeremiah here in verse 7, my people know not the rules or the law of the Lord. Now, don't try to tell them that. The people claim they're making the right decisions. They say here in verse 8, we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us. Well, they claim they're doing the right thing. The truth is their religious leaders have twisted the rules or the law, the word of God. Jeremiah records that here in verse 8. The lying pen of the scribes has made God's word into a lie. Isn't that typical? False religious leaders have this amazing ability to take God's word and turn it upside down and and twist it inside out in order to deny what it clearly says and, and, and even make people comfortable with sinning. You know, over the years, I've, I've had unmarried couples come into my office and tell me that God was just fine with them living together. and Why, you know, what they're doing made perfect sense. Well, the people of Judah are claiming God's approval, doing the same thing. But God says here in verse 9, they've rejected the word of the Lord. And consequently, judgment is coming. Verse 16 vividly describes the coming Babylonian invaders. At the sound of the neighing of their stallions, the whole land quakes. They come and devour the land and all that fills it, the city and and those who dwell in it. I am sending among you serpents that cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, declares the Lord. Wow, what a warning of defeat and destruction and pain and death that are on the way. But let me tell you, through it all, there is still this this invitation from the Lord. Over here in chapter 9 now, at verse 23, we read, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. In other words, knowing and following God rescues you from God's judgment. Living for yourself, trusting in your wisdom, your strength, your bank account, well, that's going to bring God's justice or judgment. Well, now chapter 10 is going to focus on the sin of idolatry, and, and it's going to make crystal clear that it is absolute, utter foolishness. God says here in verse 11, The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. He says here in verse 14, there is no breath in them. Verse 15, they are worthless, a work of delusion. In other words, you can make all the cakes in the world and bring them to these gods and goddesses and set them down there at their little idle feet. You can call Ishtar the queen of heaven or or 
whatever you want to call her, but she's made out of wood. She's decorated with silver and gold, but she and all those other man-made gods are lifeless. There is no breath in them. They can't walk, they can't talk, and they certainly can't hear anybody's prayers. Who are you listening to today? Are they pointing you to the true and living God? Well, who are you following today? Let me tell you, there is no queen of heaven, but there is a king of heaven. Like Jeremiah says back here in verse 10, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. There you have it. He is the true king of heaven. Well, until our next wisdom journey, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.